Well, good evening, guys. Good to see y'all. Thank you for being here. I'll give you a quick report. My shoes did dry out after the baptism. So I'm excited about that, yeah. It's that robe. What happens is, because I'm not in the water, right? I'm outside the water. But when you put somebody under the water, the, the robe gets wet, the sleeve does, and it gets completely soaked. And then when I, because we had multiple people, so I did this, and then when I moved my hand, all that water dumped straight on my foot. And I thought, well, I might as well just jump in, you know, at this point. So anyway, good to see everybody tonight. Uh, let me pray for us. We'll sing a couple of songs, and then we will start a brand new book tonight. We're going to start the book of Exodus. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for our Sunday school hour, for our worship time. Thank you for this afternoon and bringing us back here safely to worship you. Lord, fill us with your spirit during this hour. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, would you stand with me, please? We'll sing. We'll start with Ferris Lord Jesus tonight. seated. You're in good voice tonight. I'd, Brother John, I'd like to sing five or six here if that'd be all right. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, this next one is one that's kind of, it just got in this hymnal. I don't think it was in any of the uh, previous ones. The, I know it wasn't in the 95 or the or 75 or the 56. No, so it wasn't in any of those, uh, but it should have been. And it's such a great old hymn, and I hope you'll sing it with gusto tonight, just like you did that one. There are things as we travel this earth, shifting sands that transcend In this world 
and I'm going to bow out here, guys, because for, you know, so we can be fair, because they say I can't sing with them. So here we go, guys, I believe. I believe. Amen. I really like that song, and I appreciate Bill humbly bowing out of that, uh, <laughs> that verse. Gave me a chance to show off, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Y'all take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. It is interesting, uh, I'm, I've got a little piece of paper here I'm going to keep in my Bible as we go through this book. There's a lot of dates and a lot of things happening, and if you, if you want a copy of what I've got, just send me an email and I can send it to you. Uh, some time has passed between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. Uh, let me, let me kind of tell you what's, what's happening here. We, we can figure out, and I won't go into all the details, we'll do this in other sermons, but the Exodus happened about 1446 B.C. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago that anytime you're going to, if you're going to buy a resource, you're going to buy a study Bible, you're going to buy a commentary or something like that, the first place I always turn to is to Exodus to see where they put the date. If they put the date in the 1400s, that means they believe the Bible. If they put the date in the 1200s, that means they don't. Uh, so that's a pretty quick check to make sure that what you've got is actually a, a conservative resource. So without going into the details of why 1446, that's when the Exodus was. We'll talk about that later. We know from Exodus chapter 12 that they were down there for 430 years. Which means that the time when the family actually went down to Egypt was in the 1870s B.C. So we are now moving forward from the 1870s to the 1400s. And so some time has passed. They've been down there for a long time. And during that time, something very important happened. The pharaohs, the family that was in charge of Egypt, when Joseph was second in command, they are conquered. They are taken over. And another group of people take over Egypt. We know that this happened in the 1700s. So Joseph was in the 1800s. By the 1700s, the people who Joseph was associated with, that group of leaders have been conquered. That's why we're going to have a verse in just a minute that says that a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph. And the reason for that is that it is a different group of people. And so that is ultimately who's going to enslave uh, the nation of Israel. And, I, and I've got all this uh, laid out in a lot of different detail that, if, like I said, if you're interested in that, just send me an email and I can send you uh, that document. So we've jumped forward in time. Now Moses is going to back up a little bit. He's, as the writer, he's going to remind us of who's down there. But we're going to see that we're, we have now moved towards the time where God's going to begin to work to free his people. Because when we finished up last week, everything was good. Joseph was there. He was still second in command. He, you know, the only person more powerful than him is Pharaoh. And then when you go the next page in your Bible, that's just, that's it. Now they're, they're killing babies because they're afraid uh, of the nation and they're enslaving them. So that's what has happened over time. So I'm not going to read the whole thing at once. We'll just take it a few verses at a time as we walk through the text. Here's how Moses starts the book. Uh, 
These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. And then he reminds us, Joseph was already in Egypt. And we know that he was there and he had a couple kids and all of that. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. So everybody who was that original group has passed away. But that doesn't slow the nation down. That doesn't slow the family down. They are about to grow exponentially. And look at, look at verse 7. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Did you recognize anything? We've just been through Genesis 1 through 11 on Sunday mornings right before we got to Christmas. And that language, Moses is going back to the beginning of the book of Genesis and using that same language of be fruitful and multiply, the exact same wording, the exact same language. In Genesis 1.22, Moses had written as he's telling us how the world is created, and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. That's the same, same word he's using here that's translated multiplied in verse 7. In Genesis 9, 1, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Those are the same words, the same language here in verse 7 where it says they were fruitful and increased. And later on in Exodus, we're going to hear about the frogs. And he's going to use a word swarm. It says in Exodus 8, 3, the Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. And he's gonna, he uses that exact same word for swarm in verse 7 to talk about how the earth land was filled with them. In fact, the literal translation. The, the literal translation, and this is, I'm not a Hebrew expert, so I didn't do the translating, right? But the literal translation reads, of verse 7, reads this way. Moses really wants us to understand that this group of 70 have now become so large that the Egyptians are about to get worried. And here's how he describes it. As for the Israelites, they grew, they were fruitful, they swarmed, they increased, they got powerful more and more, and the land was filled with them. That is the literal word-for-word -word wooden translation of verse 7. Moses is hammering home. Picture in your mind, we're going to, about a million people is where they're going to be eventually because we know how many fighting men uh, that they're going to have. So what was the average size of a Southern Baptist church? 70 people. That's about average. We're about 80 on average. If you went to any, a typical Southern Baptist church this morning, you're going to find about 80 people. That has now exploded into, and, here, and what's about to happen, the Egyptians are about to get nervous, and everything that they do to try to make it shrink makes it just grow more and more and more and more. It's interesting what God does here. So, verse 8. There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. That's the people who came in and, and conquered. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. The reason they thought like this is because that's what they had done. They had come in and they had conquered and they, they had defeated the, the, previous, the previous leaders in the nation. And they get to looking around in the land of Goshen and there's all these people there and there's all these, these men who are of military age and it dawns on them. If somebody comes in and recruits these folks, we're going to be overwhelmed. We're not going to be able to defeat them. We are, we are absolutely sunk. We've got to do something about these people. Hundreds of years have passed now. They have not gone back to Canaan. They're still down there in the land of Goshen. And now the leaders, they feel like they've got to do something. Verse 11, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses, but the more they were oppressed, 
This is God's hand in this. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. Here, here's what's happening. What is happening is this oppression is something that Abraham heard about. As far back as Genesis chapter 15, we knew this was going to happen. Genesis 15, 13, the Lord said to Abram, so before even he was renamed Abraham, the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted. That's the same we're here for oppressed for 400 years. It's a, they round off. They were down there for about 430. Sometimes they'll say 450. Sometimes they round up. Sometimes they round down. So everything that God has said was going to happen is happening. And everything the Egyptians are going to try to do to get rid of these people is going to backfire. They're just going to grow more and more and more and more. Verse 13, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field and all their work they ruthlessly made them work as slaves this is an amazing transition because they went down there for rescue they went down there because they were at the point of death they were going to starve to death and God has kept them alive and not only has he kept them alive He's now preparing them ultimately, because we know the rest of the story. We know where this is going. He is preparing them not just to be a large family. He's preparing them to be a nation. He's preparing them to be a group of people that ultimately he is going to entrust with the gospel, with his scriptures, with all the prophecies, all of these things. That's who he is making. That's who he's creating down here. And the Egyptians are nervous about it. And they're like, okay, here's the plan. We're going to work them to death. And we're going to have them go build these cities. And so they're probably thinking, well, then the men are going to be away. They won't be with their wives. So that'll, you know, the population won't grow as quickly. We'll work them so hard that they just fall out dead. And so that, you know, and they're thinking that ultimately these people will start to taper off just because of how bad it is. But the opposite happens. The harder they push, the more they multiply, the more they grow. It's the exact opposite. Well, they come up with a new plan. Verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra, the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. So now they come up with another plan. This thing of working them to death, and that's a, a literal thing, they thought they were going to work them to death, isn't working. So now, rather than trying to kill them on the far end of their life, they're going to try to take care of them in the beginning. And here's what they say. If it's a boy, take it out. If it's a girl, go ahead and let her live. You, you can imagine why. You know, boys are going to grow up to be, you know, potential warriors. And, all, you know, if what they think is going to happen is going to happen and another nation is going to come in, the, the, these, these, these boys are gr going to grow up and they're going to be military age and they're going to be ready to fight and do all their things because now they've enslaved them. So, so they would surely side with somebody else who would come in. So they're, they're making their own problem worse at this point. And so this is their plan. They think, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll tell the midwives because we've enslaved them, right? They have to do what we say because we're in charge. Here's what I want you to do. Well, verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Enough of the presence of the gospel, enough of the presence of, of, of the nature of God was around, still there, that these midwives had enough understanding to fear the Lord, to fear God, and to not do this thing. And this is, this is, an, this is a big risk they're taking. Because who's given them the command? Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who the entire nation considers to be a god. So a god, in the eyes of the nation, have looked at these two women and said, here's what I want you to do. They don't do it. Now, most likely some time has now passed. 
Because, you know, a lot of times, you ever seen old pictures like back in the 1800s and 1700s and you see little kids and you can't tell the girls from the boys, right? Because they would wear the same clothes and sometimes they'd let the boys' hair grow. Like, go back and look like at pictures of, um, I think it's uh, President Roosevelt, uh, Franklin, uh, when he was little or even Teddy, you know, because there's pictures out there. It's really kind of silly. You, it, to us, it's like this, what in the world? You're dressed them like a girl. Well, this is just what they did. Most likely, it took a while for Pharaoh to catch on that there's still a lot of boy kids running around here because you might not be able to tell for the first few years, but now the population hasn't been affected. There seems to be as many young men as there ever were. There seems to be as, as many, you know, middle school boys as there ever. So now what are they going to do? Verse 18, so the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? And let the male children live. And then one of my favorite answers in all the Bible, if you know this, it, this just strikes me as this is so bold and so funny and so courageous. The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. <laughs> Pharaoh, your women are weak. That's why. We're not there. Your women are fragile. Your women need help. But the Hebrew women, they don't even really need us. It's an amazing thing they've said. And the truth is, as you think about it, most likely because God is doing some supernatural stuff here, right? They're multiplying despite the oppression. Most likely they're telling the truth that God just provided during this time to put them in this position where they can legitimately look at Pharaoh who could have any moment said, just kill him. Just kill him. They can look at him and say, look, since you told us that, we're never on time. The baby's always born. They're not like the Egyptian women. It's, it's, it's one, I just love it. I love the, the boldness here. I love what, and, and God ultimately blesses these two women because most likely, and throughout a lot of cultures, the midwives were, the, the women who served as midwives were ones who could not have children themselves because, you know, they had, they had all these responsibilities. I mean, you figure this is a large group of people they were probably pretty busy because we've been told, despite the oppression, they're having a bunch of babies. So, you know, they would have been quite busy. But verse 20, so God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. So now the midwives have babies. God's blessing them. And then Pharaoh's, this is really a precursor of what we're going to see in chapter 2 when we get there. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. And why would he say cast him into the Nile? The Nile was considered to be a god. And they probably thought this gets them a little bit off the hook for murdering all these babies because it is now the will of the Nile whether or not this baby survives. Well, they're not going to survive the Nile. There's plenty of things in there to, to take them out. But that's what he's doing. I read something this week as I was studying for this that had never occurred to me. You might have thought about this, right? But I never connected this. It's interesting what happens here. And there's a couple other times where this happens in the Exodus. The Pharaoh says, we're going to drown their kids. How is the army defeated when we get to the Red Sea? I, I never thought about that. I never thought about that at all. In fact, it's going to be interesting later on in the book when God is going to call Israel his firstborn. He's going to call that nation his firstborn. Who dies when the angel comes over? Firstborn. So there's, there's some interesting parallels that happen here. The, the water one had never occurred to me. I mean, basically, Pharaoh has decided he's going to go after God's people and drown them. And what ends up happening is God drowns them. It, it's, it's, I, when I, it was like a light bulb. I, couldn't, I thought, how have I missed this um, over the years? And, of course, it's early in the book, and you get caught up in things and, and all of that. So that's chapter 1. It's pretty straightforward. Things have been going well in Genesis. 
Joseph has, or Jacob has blessed the boys in those last two chapters. He has passed away. They go back and bury him. They come back. You remember the brothers came with their hat in their hand and, and asked for Joseph's forgiveness. He said, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So everybody's still alive. Judah, from whom Jesus is going to come, he has survived. Our salvation, that, that plan that's been set up since before the foundation of the earth that God started telling us about in Genesis, that's still in place because the tribe of Judah is continuing to increase. But then several hundred years pass, and now somebody else is in charge. They didn't know who Joseph was. They get all nervous about what, what's happening. They enslave the nation thinking, we're going to put a stop to this. And all that happens is God continues to bless them. They continue to grow and grow and grow and grow, despite the fact that they've been enslaved despite the fact that they're being worked to death, despite the fact that these women have to bravely stand up to a God, little g, and not do what he said for them to do. What's the point of all of it? Here's the point. This is pretty straightforward. Trials bring triumph. When you and I go through stuff, God wants to use it in our lives to grow us in our faith. Here's what James said in James 1, 2, and 3. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet, ver meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's, this is a pretty big test of faith. For Pharaoh to look at these ladies, and then later than that, everybody else, and say, you need to kill these boys. And yet they don't do it. Moses' parents, or Moses, when we meet them in the next chapter, they don't do it. And God uses that ultimately to take that nation and, and to rescue them. All kinds of interesting things are going to happen. It, Moses is, this is a little preview, by the way. No one in the history of ever was as prepared as Moses was to do what he did. And here's what I mean by that. In a few chapters, when Moses, representing the nation of Israel, goes in before Pharaoh with the whole let my people go and all that, he grew up there in the courts. He grew up with these people. The pomp, the circumstance, the situation is not intimidating to him. It's like if you and I, if I walked into the White House right now or walked into the halls of Congress I w it'd, be like, it'd be like, you know, you'd be looking around. You'd be like, wow, look at this. I mean, some, maybe some of you have been there. Moses, when he goes into Pharaoh, he's going in the house where he grew up. So he's not intimidated. He knows the culture. He knows who they are. He knows them personally. He is not thrown by this situation at all. And we're going to see that beginning in chapter 2, how God's going to prepare him to do that. Now, he's going to go through some stuff before that happens. But it's amazing to me every time how God's going to prepare him. That's another sermon when we get there, but just a little, a little preview of what we're going to see in Moses. But back to tonight. Trials bring triumph. When you and I go through stuff as believers, because that's it's God's people here who are being oppressed, so that's, that's the application. When you and I as believers go through things, because that's what happens. You repent of your sins, you place your faith in Jesus Christ, now you've got a target on your back. If you're lost, Satan just doesn't care what you're up to. He, he's going, you know, if you're lost, you can come up with all kinds of terrible things to do on your own. You know, you don't need any help. But the moment you become a believer, you've chosen sides. And you've chosen the right side. And so now we go through stuff. Health crisis, family crisis. Uh, you pick it. I mean, just financial stuff, relationship issues, whatever it might be. And when we're in all that stuff, we can't see it. Because that's the tough part, right? You wish you could back up and see how all this plays out. You can't. But you can look back at things you've gone through in the past and realize, no, God did use this. God did get me through this. And he, it, I understand now why it happened. So what we have to do in the midst of what we're going through now is say, well, if I can trust him then for the thing, I need to trust him now. And it'll make sense on the other side. When they were out there making those bricks, 
they really didn't know much about the Lord even at that point. A lot of the knowledge had passed. There was enough of it there that the, obviously the midwives had some fear of God. But it's almost like they're reintroduced to who Yahweh is when Moses shows back up and they get the Ten Commandments and all that. So very little witness as far as that goes. When they're there out in that sun and they're making the bricks and, and, and they're being oppressed, they're not thinking, wow, I can't wait to see how God's going to use this. They're thinking, these people are trying to kill us. But on the other side of it, on the other side of it, when they see the glory of God, the fire at night and the pillar of cloud by day, when they hear his voice speak the Ten Commandments, when we get to Exodus 20, you'll see it. The Ten Commandments are spoken by God. It scares them to death. They basically look at Moses and say, you talk to him and come back and tell us what he said. We can't handle it. And so all of these amazing things they're going to see only come because of what they've gone through. Same thing's true for, for you and same thing's true for me. This is a fallen, difficult world. Sometimes we make dumb mistakes and cause our own problems. I don't know why we do that, but we do. And God can even use our dumb mistakes to grow us in our faith because he guides us through that. Sometimes the world just piles it onto us and we're innocent in things. And we have to deal with it. And ultimately, he gets the glory for that. But trials bring triumph. Trials bring growth. So here's what I want to encourage you on tonight. If you're a believer, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I, I want you to begin to see your trials from God's perspective. Now, you're not going to understand why you're going through the thing you're going through. You've got to get on the other side of that. But have the faith to say, you know what? I don't know why my car keeps doing this thing. Right? Because that's, that's, I mean, we all have to, we live in a town. You can't walk anywhere. You got to have a car. I mean, you walk somewhere, they're going to hit you with a car. <laughs> so you've got to have a car to defend yourself. You know, and when your car is messed up, that's a, that's a thing. Right? And it, it's a difficult thing to go through. Why are you dealing? Why, why, why is why are you having this problem with your health? I don't know. But if you're a believer, God's going to use it. He's going to use it to grow you in your faith. You might not understand it, but when you get on the other side of it, he, here's what I've seen over the years. When you and I go through things, whether it's personal issues or health issues, whatever it might be, when you get on the other side of it, there's usually you usually come across somebody who's in the middle of it. And you get to encourage them in it. It's an amazing thing. I've seen it over and over again in church life. The Lord will just connect two people up. And one will be able to say, I've been there. And let me tell you how, this, how the Lord got me through it. So tonight I want to say to you, whatever it is, just say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to work this out, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. You can only say that, however, if you're one of God's people. Unless you've repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you're not a believer, you don't have this principle. You don't have this promise. So tonight, repent of your sins, place your faith in Jesus, and be saved. And then he will use the trials, because the trials are going to stay there. The world's falling. Everybody deals with stuff. Right? We all deal with, with money issues and doctor issues and family issues. and All that, all that stuff is, is just a part of life. The question is, is God going to use it for his glory in your life? So musicians, you guys can, can head on this way. We're launching tonight into the book of Exodus. We're going to see so many pictures of the gospel. We're going to see pictures of baptism. We're going to see pictures of the cross. We're going to see just some amazing things that Genesis has been getting us ready for. And, and it's, it's action-packed and all kinds of things. We're just getting started. And right here at the beginning, the Lord's letting us know all this stuff we're going to see these people go through, he's going to use it for his glory. All the stuff that you're going through, if you know him, he's going to use it for his glory. So during our time of response, if you've got something you need to take to him and just say, Lord, I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust you. Take it to him. Name it. Whatever the thing is. Or pray for someone you know who is going through something very difficult and they don't know Jesus. Pray for them to come to faith in Christ so that that trial will be used for his glory in their life.
Let me pray for us, guys, and we'll have our time of response. Father, we thank you for preserving this story. We thank you for inspiring Moses to, to go back and to write down how all of this transpired. Father, I pray for every believer in the room that you would remind us that you use our trials to grow us and mature us. And Lord, if there's one here who's uh, in the room, or maybe they're watching and they don't know you, I pray tonight they'd repent of their sins, place their faith in Christ, be saved. And then all those trials that they go through would be for your glory and, so, and for their growth in their faith. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.